Dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, it's uh, again a great pleasure for me and all the speakers to be with you this afternoon for this new ANS skill based section webinar dedicated to paracellal tumors. You are very interested in uh, our webinars. You are again 600 to register this afternoon, but the enthusiasm is also shared by the speakers. As you can see, more and more speakers are present. And this evening, you will again listen to a very interesting, incredible panel of speakers to detail with you all the aspects relate, related to paracellar tumors. First of all, we have uh, Timothy Jackson from Lyon. We will discuss the anatomy. Then uh, Marcos Tatagiba from Tübingen. We will discuss the frontolateral supraorbital approach to paracellar meningiomas when this canal optic opening needed. Then we'll follow Professor Pierre Groche from Marseille to speak about the lesson learned from anterior client with process resection for the surgery of paracellar meningiomas. Then uh, Professor Schroeder from Greswald, Germany, on the endoscope assisted eyebrow approach to paracellar lesions. Then we'll follow Emmanuel Juano on the indications of cavernous surgery for pituitary and adenomas. And finally, Diego Mazatenta from Bologna on the endoscopic approach to Meckel's cave and infra temporal fossa tumor. As you see, the program is again very interesting. And we will start first by Timothy Jackson on the anatomy. Please, Timothy. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor to speak to you today and to try to take back to anatomy and speak about the, you know, the, the basics uh, of anatomy, about uh, the process screen and so let's do this. Okay. And uh, sorry, yes. Okay, the, the topic today is the paracellar tumors. So I just wanted to go with me, uh, give some uh, you know, marks and advice, or maybe uh, some uh, you know, so ideas about the, the anatomy of the paracellar area. And uh, where is the paracellar area? It's just uh, close to the cellular area. And uh, as we will discuss in the next, uh, in the next uh, presentations, there are several approaches to reach the paracellar area. And uh, we, I, I will focus on the, the endoscopic and the nasal approach and the surgical anatomy of this approach. And then the pterinal subtemporal lateral approach to the paracellar area. If you think about that, is where is the paracellar area? It's just lateral to the lateral to the pituitary gland, and you can find the ICA and just lateral to it, the cranial nerves. And I will try to show you some landmarks and how to recognize the structures that can uh, lead the surgeon to reach this area, which is very difficult to reach actually. So let's have a look at the anterior endoscopic and nasal approach, and then the lateral, pterional, and septemporal approach. First of all, I will give you some prerequisites in cell based anatomy. My purpose is to give you six relief and six ligands that you have to remind you know, about skull based anatomy. And then we will speak about the endoscopic approach and just uh, a quick reminder about the four cavernous sinus compartments. And then we talk about the lateral approach and a quick reminder about the four cavernous sinus and four middle fossa triangles. And then how the, know, uh, the knowledge of the anatomy of the paracellular area can uh, lead and can help about the surgical strategy of such paracellar tumors. So the first point is just to remind that if you look at the skull base from superior, 
you will find some bone release. And the first is the pituitary fossa, right? And then you have posteriorly dorsum cellae and then anteriorly the tuberculum cellae, then the limbus, spondylidae, and lateral. You will find the anterior clinical process, posterior the petrous apex and medial the uh, uh, there are some ligaments and it's just uh, good to remind that there are a ligament between the anterior and the posterior clinical processes which is the interclinoid fold or interclinoidal ligament and then between the petrous apex and the ACP there is an anterior petroclinoid fold and then between the dorsum cilia and the posterior clinical process and the petrous apex a posterior petroclinoid fold. All of this is very simple, actually, if you think about the structures, uh, the, the ligaments light together, right? And if you look at the, this triangle uh, drawn by the interclinoid fold and the anterior petroclinoid and posterior petroclinoid fold, you can find this triangle, which is the quite the, the, the oculometer triangle. So it's just a quick remind about the bone relief of the cellar region and then the ligament of this paracellular area. It's good to remind, remind them to, uh, uh, to have a better understanding of the, the next presentations. And then you can imagine if you superimpose on the skull base uh, bone, the ligaments, you will have this kind of view on the left corner uh, from the rotten, the inter and all of the draw the oculometer triangles, as you can see on the uh, left corner. So that just a quick remind. And then I want to uh, uh, go for to the anterior endoscopic and the nasal approach, and to see you that the things, the things, uh, the younger of us have to know about the skull base anatomy uh, from the endoscopic perspective. If you go anteriorly, you will uh, cross the nasal pits and then the sphenoid, the sphenoid sinus. And uh, first landmarks uh, good to know is the H shape described by Kassam that gives you the level of the pterygoid canal at the level of the the cross uh, between the uh, horizontal line and the vertical line of the H shape. You will find the pterygoid canal with the median nerve. That's a good landmark. And if you enter in the right nasal pits, you will uh, follow the bottom of the nasal pits and then the, uh, find the, the arch of the corona. And then you go up and you will find the ostium of the sinus sinus you enter into it and you will find the classical landmarks of the sphenoid uh, sinus. Then you go lateral and you will expose the orbits. You will open the maxillary sinus. You remove the bone, the thin layer of bone of the lateral recess into the sphenoid sinus. And you will find the cavernous sinus, the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. And one very important paper about the anatomy of the cavernous sinus have been uh, proposed by uh, Fernandez Miranda, Juan, uh, in uh, 2018. And he described some compartments uh, of the cavernous sinus from the endonasal perspective. Is it just a quick reminder about if you think about that, you can divide the, the cavernous sinus into four compartments, a superior one, a posterior one, an inferior one, and even a lateral one. And each of them uh, contains some structures very important to know if you want to go in this region uh, using a surgical approach. So I, I won't uh, put, uh, spend too much time to describe these structures because the next presentation will, will do it. 
So just a quick remind of the quantum levels you can find uh, in each compartment, superior, inferior, post. Another anatomical point is just to remind that there are a lot of branches from the ICA and some of them arise from the ICA in the current sinus, like the inferior hypophyseal artery, the meningo hypophyseal trunk of the ICA, and last, uh, the inferolateral trunk of the ICA. Then just have a look at the lateral approach and the surgical anatomy. You have to understand if you want to do it properly, right? We just talk about the anterior and now we go lateral. If you move this sphenoid bone, just to understand that you reach the parastellar area from lateral. And you have to uh, get a, a good understanding of the anatomy of the middle cranial fossa. You can go extraordinarily, but also intraordinarily, as the next speakers will show you. But if, if you look at the middle cranial fossa, you have this kind of view. Intraordinarily, you can uh, guess the trajectory of uh, the trigeminal nerve, but you can you can see the structures within the paracel area. So you have to you have to remove you have to peel the dura mater, and you have this kind of view thanks to. We can understand the structures within the paracelar areas from a, a lateral perspective. And you can identify from top to down the oculomotor nerve, the fourth nerve, and the trigeminal nerves. And if you want to understand these structures uh, using a, a lateral uh, approach, you have to put it upside down, like, like this. Put it upside down. About the cavernous sinus. And it's easy to understand them actually, because you can name them uh, because of the, the, the structures around them. The first triangle is the clinoidal segment, just in front of the clinoid process. And then you have the oculomotor triangle, a supratrochlear, infratrochlear. And then you have four triangles uh, in the middle cranial fossa. The first one is anteromedial, anterolateral, and then you have the posterior lateral triangle and the posteromedial. And all of these four last triangles are described around the ICA and the trigeminal nerves. Important to understand them, and we can see on this trick, this picture that you can uh, enter in the sphenoid sinus if you cross the cavernous sinus, if you remove all of these structures. But one important thing to understand is there are a lot of cranial nerves, there are a lot of structures like vascular, the ICA. You have to cross this very uh, complex region. So what about the surgical strategy? If you want to reach the paracellar region, you can reach it from medial using the anti-endoscopic and nasal approach. You can reach it from lateral using a lateral, tenal, or subtemporal approach. But why you want to, to reach this region? Because there is a tumor. And the best surgical corridor would be this one that will be opened by the tumor. And it's good to know the triangles. It's good to know the cavernous sinus compartments from the endoscopic perspective. But the best surgical corridor will be this one that will be opened by the tumor. And if you want to identify it, you have to identify the trajectory of the ICA and the cranial nerves. And you can do that if you know the anatomy but also if you use the imaging, the MRI, the CT scan, and recently some, you know, technology of uh, such tumors in the areas, 
and uh, is very there are some very important very useful tools you can use to precisely depart the trajectory of corneas and ICA and then to choose the best corridor to reach a paracellar tumor so that was my talk my purpose today just a quick remind about the anatomy from the anterior endoscopic and the nasal perspective and then from lateral open uh, perspective. So thanks, thank you very much for everyone to listen to me and uh, hope you learn something today for the youngers. Thank you so much, uh, Timothy. It was uh, an impressive talk and it's not always easy to detail anatomy and make the, the talk attractive, but you were truly fascinating. Your illustration uh, and explanations were truly incredible. Thank you so much. Then we will, with, it was a great pleasure, Timothy. I hope to see you in new webinars again. <laughs> very interesting. Thank you, Mr. Bruno. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think everybody will agree. Such uh, beautiful illustrations, uh, such clear explanations on the anatomy, which can sometimes be a boring topic, but uh, as illustrated in this way, it is uh, extremely interactive uh, and uh, very helpful. Thank you. Then, Marcos, it's up to you to discuss the frontal lateral, meaning the supraorbital approach to paracellar meningioma. When is the optic canal opening needed for you? Yes, thank you very much, Mike. It's a great pleasure to be uh, with you again. And uh, let me uh, come to the first slide. And um, so this, I guess, this is a very important topic because uh, we all are dealing with this. Uh, we are all dealing with this issue. Uh, somebody has a microphone. The microphone. Um, yes. Um, so we are all involved uh, with this uh, type of uh, problem. And the question is always, when shall we open the optic canal? Some people are reluctant, um, some others are more aggressive. I have no disclosures. So first thing I would like to say is that this is my preferable approach for uh, supracellular meningiomas. I've tried many other approaches, but this is um, my preferable one. This is a very simple, straightforward, after 10 minutes, you are opening the dura mater and uh, it's very flexible because you can go uh, lateral to of, of the carotid, between carotid and optic, between the optics. So I like this approach for supracellular meningiomas, clinoid, anterior clinoid, uh, planosphenoidale meningiomas, but also for ACOM aneurysms, ACA aneurysm, even for basilar tip aneurysms. This is a very flexible uh, approach. And uh, it can be done this way if the patient, um, if it's, uh, for instance, a patient uh, not having uh, difficulties in accepting this, as, uh, this uh, incision, this is for aesthetic purpose at long term better because it's behind the hairline. But uh, you can see here the steps, position of patients, clean flap, periosteal flap, we do separately, um, the bow hole at, uh, at the typical area, uh, like for a pterional approach. But the difference uh, regarding pterional approach is that we remain, me uh, we remain medial to a sphenoid wing. And the medial limit of this approach is the supraorbital foramen. So this way we are going to avoid opening the frontal sinus in the large majority of the cases. The, op the other option is to do uh, eyebrow incision. I don't like so much the eyebrow incision because uh, frequently the uh, aesthetic uh, results are not as beautiful as uh, skin flap, but this is sometimes also useful for people don't having hairs or people having very uh, thick eye. Entschuldigung, ich habe gerade Probleme, dich zu verstehen. And, uh, and this, so this, this um, approach is very useful. 
and uh, as I said, is very uh, fast to be done. So I would like to show one example here. This is another video. You see two and a half to three uh, centimeters. We go straight forward to the system. This is the first step to open the system to get CSF. We don't need to open the uh, to Sylvian fissure. So we avoid opening the Sylvian fissure. Then we expose uh, optic canal. This is a case where optic canal is not involved and we can go straight forward, removing the tumor at uh, between the optics and from the, from the skull base. I will go a little bit faster so you can see the procedure. Um, I, I don't like to use so much bipolars. I prefer to use irrigations just uh, the, the feeding vessels coming from the base, I, um, I can coagulate them. Otherwise, I'm not, I do not perform a, a very blood-free surgery. I, I avoid coagulation in order to avoid uh, thermic injury to the optic nerve. And uh, so at the end, we can remove the tumor like this. Uh, you can go piecemeal or you can detach the tumor from the skull base, uh, contralateral carotid, both optic nerves, uh, a contralateral posterior clinoid. We can, at the end of surgery, usually see the basilar artery and so on. So <clears throat> sometimes the optic canal is involved, like in this case, and, uh, and then we have to open the, the optic canal. So small tumor, but producing a lot of uh, uh, visual deficits on the left side. So now we are opening. Um, the system like it's the same like the other case. The oculomotor nerve and you see here this is uh, the optic nerve. So as I said, patient had uh, some um, uh, visual deficits. And uh, this is also when we have this, there is then high suspicion of, um, of invasion of optic canal. And this invasion usually happens at the medial side, but sometimes if the tumor is uh, primarily located at the anterior clinoid, the invasion is laterally. So as, as you can see, I'm not uh, taking so much care in uh, coagulating all vessels and keeping the tumor uh, free. So only if there is uh, feeding vessels bleeding, I go I use the bipolar. Otherwise, I prefer to use irrigation. I'm, I'm not uh, so much a concern if there is some blood in the field. Important is not to cause any thermic damage uh, to the optic nerve. And piecemeally, the tumor is uh, detached and then removed. I'm coming forward. So you could see the uh, invasion of the optic canal. And now when tumor is removed, I, I will clean this area. And uh, so this is a, a procedure. I have still some um, tumor here. I put a piece of glove to protect the optic nerve. And then I drill away this area uh, to clean the bone and, um, and to make hemostasis. And uh, sometimes um, if there is suspicion of tumor, I use the endoscope um, to make sure that there is no tumor behind entering the cellar area. Okay, so this is uh, the end. Now the point is, uh, if you check the literature, there are some papers uh, claiming that MRI is not demonstrating invasion of optic canal in many cases. So we decided to do a study 
uh, in our department, I'm gonna show you two studies. Both of them were conducted by Florian Ebner. Maybe you know him, he worked in my department for many years today. He is chairman at the Alfred Krupp uh, Hospital in, uh, in Essen. So um, we did this study from 2004 till 2007. We collected 558 patients with paracellar meningiomas with this follow-up you can see here. So we had in all cases pre-op MRI. This is the MRI the patient brought uh, with him when the patient came to our department. All MRIs containing flare, T1 with and without contrast, T2 weighted images, and so on. Neuroophthalmological examination, and we checked the documentation of the patients. So look at these results. From the 58 meningiomas, the MRI showed invasion of the optic canal in 20 cases. In all of these 20 cases, we opened the canal and we found the tumor. In 38 cases, the MRI was not showing any invasion of the canal and the radiologist did not describe the invasion. Nevertheless, in half of cases, we opened the canal and we found tumor in 17 cases. So in only two cases, there was no tumor inside. So this uh, result make us very concerned and worry about the capability of MRI um, to show the invasion. Look what happens ophthalmologically with these patients. Uh, in those cases, the MRI was negative and we, do, we did not open the canal. In nine cases, there was deterioration of optic function. In 77%, the optic function remained equal and in 14% improved. Um, in those cases, the MRI was not showing and uh, the, 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 the tumor invasion but we opened the canal and we found tumor and we cleaned the canal. Um, no patient deteriorated, 45% remained equal and 55% improved. And in those cases, the MRI was positive and we removed the tumor inside. The results were exactly the same like this one. So that means, um, using this technique, usual technique that uh, most radiological practice are using, if you have the suspicion based on the clinical signs of the patient or because the tumor was too much in contact with the optic nerve, um, our policy was uh, in those cases, it's better to open the canal and clean the canal. But the question was, is there any other possibility to improve the detection of the optic canal invasion? Does fat suppress series with and without in, uh, contrast enhancement would be more reliable? So we conducted a second study. We used uh, this technique. We, we checked the standard MRI, high resolution MRI, and clinical examination of the patient. So this was the second uh, 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 study we have done. Um, you see here, we included uh, 145 patients. Uh, this is the group of, uh, with standard MRI I've shown to you. And then there is a new group with 87 patients uh, who received the high resolution MRI and neuroophthalmological examination in all cases. So then we have the group with the standard MRI, I've shown you it before, the group with high resolution. We did also thin slices through the orbit and we used fat suppressed series with and without contrast and neuroophthalmological examination. Look, the first group I, I have shown to you, this group um, in which uh, in 19 of the 38 cases, we opened the canal and we found the 17, in 17 uh, uh, cases tumor. This group presented, as I told you, in all 20 cases where MRI showed invasion, we found tumor. That means 
Using standard MRI, we can get specificity of 100%, but the sensitivity of only 54% of the cases. Yeah. If you use high resolution MRI with fast suppression series and so on, what we found was this. In 60 cases, MRI detect invasion. Uh, we opened all of them, the canal. We found tumor in 53, but no tumor in seven. So in seven cases, MRI was, um, was, uh, was too much uh, showing uh, a, a tumor, which was not there. In 27 cases, MRI did not show any invasion. We opened, nevertheless, the canal in all of these cases. In 25, there was indeed no tumor. In two cases, we found nevertheless tumor. That means this technique gave specificity of 78% and sensitivity of 96%. So much better than using standard MRI. And what happens with the preoperative ophthalmological signs? Are they reliable to show an optic canal invasion? Look at this. If um, the visual function preoperatively was intact, it was intact in 24 cases. And, um, um, and uh, it was intact in, in 35 cases. And we, we had deficits in, in 52 cases. Of those, in 24 cases, there was no invasion. In 11 cases, there was invasion, if it was intact before surgery. Patients who had deficits, eight of them had no tumor. Although they had deficits, eight of them had no tumor within the canal, but 45 had tumor within the canal. That means uh, the, the presenting deficits is a is uh, you, you must um, um, uh, arise suspicion of uh, invasion of optic canal uh, in, in many cases. That means the clinical signs of the patients brings specificity of 69% and sensitivity in 85%. If you put all these things together, then you come to the conclusion that the best one in these cases is to repeat the MRI using fat suppression series with, with and without contrast, thin slices through the orbit and associate these with ophthalmological examination. Combining these methods, you have very, very reliable information whether you should open or not the optic canal. And this is now our standard in, in our department. So merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope I was clear with my message. Perfect, Marcos. You were incredibly clear. It's always interesting to show how you mastered those techniques. And it's not so easy to open the optic canal as you do to a key old approach like this. But you, you mastered truly this, uh, this approach and technique. And uh, the way you, you manage the patient with MRI and clinical examination in order to know how to, when to open or not, the optic canal is very interesting. Thank you. So we go to the next speaker, Pierre Groche. Pierre, please. I, I will listen to you about the lesson you learned from uh, anterior clinical process resection for the surgery of paracetamol meningiomas. Please, uh, Pierre. Yes, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can you see that? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So uh, I'll launch my my slideshow if it works. Okay. Oh, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm so I'm glad to be with you and share this session. Uh, thank you, Mikhail, once again for this uh, beautiful organization and the didactic message of the previous speakers. I was so happy to hear the previous one. So uh, my talk will be divided uh, in two sessions, two sections. The first one will be about uh, our view of the global management of the, of the paracetamol meningiomas. And I will focus uh, uh, through the details about the technique of ACP resections and the lessons I could learn. So uh, this is the spectrum of the paracetamol meningiomas, I would say at large. You can see that we are in facing many different situations depending on the insertion and the invasion of the uh, 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 
vicinity of the of the structures of this at the vicinity of the cavernous sinus because of the complexity of the Jura folds, as shown by uh, uh, Timote uh, previously, and uh, all, of course all these meningiomas uh, they are paracellar meningiomas, but they uh, of course they they. they put it in front of different challenges, depending on these locations uh, and extensions. So uh, we have to uh, bear in mind that uh, we have no EA, no guidelines for the management of, uh, of meningiomas. And of course, skull-based meningiomas and paracilla meningioma uh, cannot dodge in front of this kind of, uh, of uh, guidelines. And uh, there is space available for different techniques, particularly we have to bear in mind that those paracellar meningioma, most of them are very indolent. If we look at this uh, publication from the Paris group about the natural history of this paracellar meningioma, I would say it enclosed cavernous sinus meningiomas. Mostly they are very uh, benign and mostly they are very quiet, which means that observation is always an option. Uh, which we could keep in mind in front of a paracellar meningioma, particularly the ones who are enclosed and, uh, and without any uh, uh, deficit. Um, uh, the second option is the radio surgery. Uh, it's clearly indicated that in some situations, particularly the small ones uh, with uh, minor symptoms, uh, radio surgery and the gamma knife, of course, is an option to treat uh, uh, these meningiomas. And uh, uh, there are now many, many different uh, publications indicating that this radio surgery is very efficient. And uh, the inequity of the technique is clearly demonstrated by this, this series. Uh, of course, this patient won't improve when they, they are still, when they are already ophthalmoplegic, it's too late. But at least you can improve some deficit in the case of third, third nerve uh, partial deficit with radio surgery. Just uh, uh, keeping in mind that, uh, of course, you, you cannot treat big tumors, particularly the 10 cc cutoff is a, a clear a value about uh, what you, you can keep for radio surgery. Uh, and particularly if you are far from the uh, critical structures, I would say that the optic nails won't tolerate more than eight grays. And once you have a, a, a close relationship between the meningioma and the, and the uh, optic nerve and the optic pathway, of course, you have to remove the tumor first. Uh, we know that radio surgery is more efficient when the tumor is not too aggressive and particularly grade two and grade three, uh, OMS meningioma, WHO meningioma are not uh, very much elig eligible for gamma. Uh, this is here the illustration of a contraindication of a gamma knife. You have here a resection of the ACP from the left side, and you can see the relationship between, between of course, the, the, the meningioma and the optic nerve. And this is a clear contraindication for gamma. Uh, I won't promote the gamma here. Uh, we are skull based surgeons and we have to master with our techniques, but all. Nevertheless, uh, there is some room available for this technique. So microsurgery is definitely a good option for the treatment of these patients, but you have to consider if you will go for radical resection, subtotal partial resection, or if you want to go for biopsy, uh, don't forget that in some circumstances, the, the disease is, uh, looks like a meningioma, but it's not, particularly uh, when you have to face uh, plasma cell granulomas, rosé Doffman disease, uh, they looks like meningioma that they are not, and they are eligible for biopsy and not for resection, of course. Uh, so depending on the patient's condition, the signs, the diagnosis, the, 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 the MRI features, you have to decide if you will go for radical resection, subtotal, or biopsy. This is our experience uh, of uh, our paracella meningiomas managed in our, in our institution during this period of time. And uh, uh, this is the locations of our tumor we had to face. This is the approach we used to manage this patient. This is an original drawing from Dolenk because Dolenk was one of the uh, a poster of the intracavernous surgery, and he developed this ACP uh, 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 resection through the epidural approach. And we have to mention his name, of course. And I will focus on, on, on about this Dolenk approach in my in my second part of the, of my talk. So 
You see here, I, I don't want to go through the details of my results. This is not the important message, but you see that once you have fa to face with the, the paracetamol meningioma, the goal is not to achieve uh, gross total resection. The goal is to decompress the optic apparatus, uh, to reduce the, the tumor mass effect, and to go for additional gamma or fractionated radiation therapy or something like that. But uh, uh, our rate of uh, Simpson 4 resection is high, better than 1 and 2, of course, but it was it's deliberately learned from the very beginning that you won't go inside the cavernous sinus for paracelam and angioma, but you go, you keep outside the cavernous sinus. So, a uh, uh, few examples. There are cases for radical resection. This patient uh, uh, displayed a very aggressive, uh, a multi operated meningioma irradiated. He was already blind and ophthalmoplegic. Uh, he, to he tolerated very nicely the balloon test occlusion, and we went through. Uh, uh, what we call the uh, next alteration of the cavernous sinus, which is an extremely aggressive uh, uh, management because you sacrifice, of course, uh, all the cavernous sinus and the, uh, and the carotid artery with a kind of unblock resection. This is very exceptional. I did that three times in my, in my experience, and this is something you have to, uh, to keep for very aggressive tumors. Uh, conversely, in this case, you can see that in this patient, the, the tumor was growing from the pure lateral wall of the cavernous sinus with a very tiny insertion here. And you see here that there is no need to go for, for, for the, uh, an extensive approach. We did that through a standard regular uh, intradural approach and the, uh, and the insertion of the tumor was very tiny. And just with the coagulation <clears throat> of the insertion, you can remove everything in this case. Uh, the tumor make the space for you surgery. Uh, so once you open the Sylvian fissure, you debug the tumor and you go all the way to the incision. If you coagulate, the tumor soften and it's, it's, it's pretty much easy to remove this tumor without any, any difficult complex skull base approach. So even for cavernous sinus meningioma, there is some room available for very regular techniques. Uh, what about the ACP resections? Uh, of course, we all of us we know. Uh, you see on the left side, the, the left uh, panel on the on the bottom of my of my of my screen here. This is a, a, a giant uh, carotid ophthalmic meningioma. In order to get the proximal and the distal control, in order to to expose all the all the neck of the aneurysm, uh, of course, the ACP resection is is mandatory in this case if you want to 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 manage properly this aneurysm. Uh, nevertheless, uh, for, for, for meningiomas, uh, they are, of course, uh, excellent indication for the ACP resection. First, when the ACP is the origin of the tumor he itself, you can see here this uh, bony condensation of the, of the ACP itself. The tumor is not so big, but the edema is, is huge. And if you leave the, the ACP without resecting it, uh, of course, you did half of the job. So you have to remove the, the ACP because the tumor is growing from the ACP. Uh, there are all the cases where, where you need to remove the ACP to gain space, to uh, debug the tumor, to have more uh, tumor, tumor cytoreduction. This was the case here. And you see here the optic uh, uh, chiasma, which is distorted and the better way to uh, to, to work safely on the optic apparatus is to remove first uh, the ACP and then to have more space to mobilize safely the tumor uh, in order to protect the, the, the optic nerve and the optic apparatus. So uh, sometimes uh, the ACP resection is only the first step of the uh, pericavernous surgery, which is illustrated here nicely with this case. Uh, this is another illustration where the need to remove the ACP is due to the fact that you will offer uh, cytoreduction and you will decompress the optic chiasma in order to deliver secondary uh, radio surgery or fractionated uh, IMRT or whatever you want. But uh, of course, you can look at the results. This is not a very dramatic result. The, the reduction of the tumor is very modest. We kept outside the cavernous sinus, but at least we could decompress widely uh, the optic chiasma and give enough space to deliver uh, safe radio surgery afterward. Uh, here, this is a cytoreduction I showed you. Usually, I use this kind of uh, modified FTOZ approach because the tumor is going uh, very is growing upward, and in this case, it makes sense to do this FTOZ, removing removing in one piece only the optical roof, uh, the, the, the 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 orbital roof, sorry, 
but not, this is not a complete uh, full FTOZ. This is a half of the FTOZ. This is a one block one. I like this approach, but uh, I usually I use it really confidentially in case of very large tumors. Okay, depending on what you want to do inside, the skin incision uh, may vary. If you want to go for an FTOZ, a full one, you will uh, do this kind of uh, question mark uh, uh, skin incision, particularly if you want to, co want to combine your surgery with a Kawase approach. Otherwise, if you go for a re regular Tayonal approach, uh, the regular traditional skin incision is, is, is more than enough. The second step is to expose uh, uh, the dura around, around, around the, 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 your target, which is the, uh, the, the inner third of the lower sternal wing, wing, which is an uh, inclinoid process here. And you have to elevate gradually the temporal dura here and the frontal dura here. And you have to gain space between the temporal and the frontal dura in order to expose this uh, ACP you can see here the key structures with is the, uh, the periorbital fold, uh, which is a, uh, the temporal uh, orbital fold here, which you will have to cut afterwards. So at the end of the surgery, you can see here that the anterior clinoid process has been removed, which is here. And you can see here the paracella, uh, the, 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 the unroofing, the skeletonization of the uh, optic canal. You can uh, uh, skeletonize as far as 270 degrees around the optic canal. I liked very much the approach of Marcos Tatagiba, but going from this supraorbital approach, you can just only unroof, but you cannot manage the lateral part of the optic canal, and you cannot remove the optic strut, which is the, the floor of the optic canal. And I guess that when you want to uh, skeletonize more than 180 degrees, you need to remove this ACP in this way. Uh, and once it has been done, you cut uh, the dura at the level of the superorbital fissure and you will elevate the dura propria to enter inside the cavernous sinus if you need to do it. Once again, in case of meningioma, I'm very reluctant to remove inside because there is no need to do that. Uh, but if you want to do that, for, for example, for macroadenomas or for chondrosarcomas, uh, this is the corridors as showed by uh, uh, Timothée previously. So uh, if we have a few minutes to go through this uh, video, it was done by Dr. Trude, one of my collaborators. This was an ACP uh, meningioma with the paracellar infiltration. We are on the left side and it will illustrate what I previously mentioned. You have to expose the frontal orbital dura here and the temporal polar dura here. One of the key points is to drill uh, the uh, lateral wall of the orbit and the floor and the roof of the orbit and to elevate gradually uh, the dura, uh, uh, altogether the frontal dura and the temporal polar dura. Uh, please pay attention to the drill you use. Usually I always use a five millimeters, uh, um, I would say diamond drill under copious irrigation in order to damage the periorbita and to avoid any, any, any uh, uh, thermal thermic uh, uh, trauma of the optic nerve, particularly in the in at the level of, of the ACP. As you see, I'm not uh, I, 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 I'm 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 not inside the ACP, but I, I I do the job. The bone work is very important before before going through the ACP in order to widen the corridor. Uh, this is a junction between the periorbita and the temporal polar dura here. And you can see uh, the orbital temporal uh, temporal terminal fold, which is indicated here. And you have to coagulate this uh, and to cut it. Uh, people are reluctant to do that because they consider that uh, this is the, the, the superorbital fissure. This is not exactly the superorbital fissure. And there is no risk to uh, cut this meningoorbital fold in order to elevate the dura propria uh, from the superorbital fissure and uh, to improve the corridor uh, around the ACP, which is key in order to remove it uh, safely. So this step, this uh, 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 dual work is essential to expose the, the relief, the contour of the ACP. We are still on the left side, by the way. This is the elevation of the dual propria, the level of the superorbital fissure and cavernous sinus. You can see now uh, the beauty of this anatomy and the contour of the ACP with a simulation which is, which is not always evident, which is not always obvious to, to mentalize the position of the optic canal. 
Then we call that the eggshell technique because we dig inside the uh, ACP under irrigation with three millimeters, three millimeters diamond drill, and you uh, crack uh, the contour of the of the of the ACP. Please pay attention not to move, not to mobilize the bone, uh, this uh, 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 shark tooth at the level of the optic canal. Uh, be away from the optic canal. Then we will drill the optic roof and we will drill the optic strut to skeletonize uh, 20, uh, 270 degrees of the optic canal. And the beauty of this approach is to make the junction between the extradural and the intradural. Uh, so this cut of the dura will go all the way to the optic uh, canal, to the falciform ligaments. And you can see here, we have the junction between the extradural part and the intradural part of the optic, uh, of the optic canal. Uh, the next step is to uh, expose the dural carotid ring. You can see here, this is the distal carotid ring, which is here. And uh, which is interesting, this is the final view of my, of my video, is to show the distal ring here. And if you have the distal ring here, you have the paraclinoid segment of the internal, uh, internal carotid artery, and you will be able to widen the corridors between all of these uh, structures, because you can mobilize the carotid artery here. So moving to the next, this is the final view of my of my, another surgery. You see here uh, how uh, the resection of the ACP can open the corridors between the optic canal and uh, the optic nerve and the carotid artery and between the carotid artery and the third nerve. And the opening of this ACP allow you to open these corridors and to mobilize safely the tumor in between the corridors. So, this is one of the beauties. So if I go back to my uh, previous cases, uh, we did this procedure for, for, for a certain uh, number of patients here. Uh, and we had a 90 case where the external, uh, where the epidural uh, ACP resection was done, 90 cases. Uh, this is a patient who could be evaluated after, after this resection with the follow-up of, of 53 months. And this is our experience of the ACP resection for paracellar meningiomas here. Uh, this is the, the distribution of our patients, uh, classically uh, much more women than, than male, of course. And this is the classification we used. You see here in blue, this, this was the case of, the, of, of, of ACP tumors, which were resected using this approach. Uh, this was the case of uh, the numbers of patients who presented an ACP tumors plus a cavernous sinus invasion. We did that in 22 cases. Here you have the case of a pure cavernous sinus meningioma who needed to be treated with a, a, a resection of the lateral wall and the external uh, uh, um, or, and the epidural resection of the uh, ACP. Uh, because of the need to, to mobilize uh, and to, and to, uh, to go to be far from the optic apparatus. And here you have the case where we did this approach for patients who presented the cavernous sinus plus posterior fossa uh, meningiomas. And here were the case we used this approach for uh, uh, sphenoorbitalis meningiomas uh, involving the internal, uh, involving the uh, anterior clinoid process. Uh, and the ones we had the sphenorbitalis meningioma involving the, the paracella compartment. So this is uh, our, our cohort of patients and it's uh, interesting to see the visual results. And this is one of the key message. If we operate the patient before uh, they are severely impaired in terms of visual acuity, then we will be able to retain, as you see here in green, good results. Uh, in terms of visual acuity, and this is uh, what we obtained at last follow-up. You can note that we uh, 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 had two cases, uh, one, one or two patients who were uh, injured because of the surgery. You can see here uh, very early after the surgery. This is probably due to a direct manipulation of the optic nerve here. Uh, conversely, if the patient comes already with a non-functional uh, deficit, the chance to improve the patient is very weak. So sometimes we are reluctant to operate this patient because we say, come on, uh, the visual acuity is not so, uh, is still very good, let's wait. Uh, in my view, uh, uh, 
taking into consideration these results, uh, one of the key messages is to operate this patient very early because this is the only way to retain good results in terms of visual acuity. Uh, of course, we uh, take the risk to damage the patient. If we, if we work in the, in, in the wrong way, uh, uh, drilling too much without any irrigations, uh, you can create trauma of the nerve, thermic trauma, and sometimes ischemia, but this is very exceptional. Uh, this is another point which, is, which looks very interesting it's about the oculomotor dysfunctions. Of course, if I take only the cases where the patient had good uh, third nerve uh, uh, function before the surgery, we uh, impaired a significant percentage of them uh, only because we manipulated the third nerve, not because of the ACP resection, but because of the intradural work. In this case, you see the third nerve here. We open the uh, uh, oculomotor porous here and you remove the tumor outside the cavernous area, you manipulate the, the nerve. As, as long as you manipulate these third nerves, you might expect some deficit of the third nerve, but hopefully most of them uh, improve in the, in, in the follow-up. And there is a clear correlation, uh, correlation in our series between the cavernous sinus uh, and pericavernous manipulation of the nerve and the damage of the oculomotor nerve. So this is a clear message to, to send to our patients. So at the conclusion, uh, I would say that the ACP resection is a really very, very helpful uh, 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 technical uh, uh, um, help uh, uh, in our patients in, uh, affected with uh, paracetamol meningioma. You need to uh, consider that uh, you, you need to master uh, the technique. Uh, there are very uh, points of details which are very important to do. The eggshell technique is something very, very interesting in, in my view, but you need to drill with a, a, um, a diamond drill and a copious irrigation. Keep away from the optic nerve. Please pay attention to the anatomy before doing that. You have sometimes very uh, compact uh, uh, ACP. Sometimes you have very pneumatized uh, uh, um, ACP and you can expect some CSF leak if you do not plug uh, the zone of resection after the surgery. But in my view, this is very helpful and very, uh, and very interesting technique. Okay, this is my last uh, uh, slide. I thank you for attention. Thank you so much, Pierre Huger. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing all your tips and tricks and describe all your nuances uh, in the approach of those lesions to a very an impressive series of tumor. We will, uh, we will concentrate, I think, the question at the end of, uh, of the webinar. So uh, I'm sure that there are a lot of questions to you and Marcos as well. So we move to the next speaker, who is uh, uh, I'm very interested to know how he managed to lesion with an endoscopic assisted eyebrow approach. Please, Henri. Uh, good evening. Thanks, Michael, for inviting me again to this webinar. Can you see my screen? Is it yes. okay? Yes, but not in full screen mode. Not yet, but perfect now. Now it's okay? Yes. So my topic is endoscope-assisted eyebrow approach for paracellar lesions. And you have heard from Marcus. He also used the term supraorbital approach for uh, the frontolateral approach. In my department, we have the term frontolateral when we make the incision behind the hairline and we use the term supraorbital when we make the incision through the eyebrow just to not mix it up and that the, the guys make the wrong incision. But basically the frontolateral is the same like a supraorbital. When you make an eyebrow incision, of course, the uh, approach a little bit smaller, so it's two by two centimeters. When we make the frontolateral, it's four by three or four by four, or sometimes a little bit smaller. So uh, in contrast to Marcos, I think the eyebrow approach is really appealing approach and many patients come to us because they know we do this so-called uh, keyhole approach. And the incision is um, behind the hairline for the frontolateral approach, you see, this is the uh, craniotomy, what we do. The mutation, as uh, Marco said, is a supraorbital fissure. And we use a, a single layer myocutaneous flap. And then it's very important that you, have, that you are flush with the skull base. 
And sometimes if we have the intention to do the eyebrow incision, but we see that the frontal sinus has a um, large lateral extension and we have the risk to open it widely to get our approach done, then we don't do the eyebrow approach because you cannot harvest any material to close it. So if we have a large opening, the frontal sinus, then the best incision is behind the hairline because you can harvest periosteum and muscle. And you see, even if you make this old fashioned incision behind the hairline, you can have a good result with not much muscle wasting if you take care of the muscle innervation and blood supply. We tried to improve our cosmetic results to don't cut through the muscle, but to detach it from the temporal line and retract it uh, laterally. And then we resutured it. But in my opinion, we found that the cosmetic result is better if we simply make a monolayer flap. So the eyebrow superaudial approach has several indications. You can overlook the whole frontal skull base. We use it for smaller lesions, so less than, let's say, three to four centimeters. It's ideal for prechiasmatic lesions. So for craniofacial geomas, it's not so good because usually these craniofacial geomas cause a prefix chiasm. You can reach all lateral tumor extensions. You can deal with involvement of the anterior cerebral artery complex, and you can also use it for aneurysms of the anterior circulations and also for the basilar tip. I think for the eyebrow approach, it's very important that you use endoscope assisted techniques because you have several blind corners if you make a small approach. And we have different angles of view. Usually we have the small scopes with a diameter of 2.7 millimeters. And of course you need angulated instruments to reach the tumor, which is only visible on the view of an angulated endoscope. In most cases, we use the endoscope freehand just for inspection, although we check is the tumor completely removed. But if we see there is a significant amount of tumor uh, remaining, then we fix the endoscope to a mechanical holding arm. The pneumatic arm, the mitaka arm, is too bulky, in my opinion, so I just use the standard one. You fix the endoscope here, and then you have both hands free, and you can dissect as you are used to do it under the microscope with traction and counter traction. And this is our setup in the operation room. So you have the screens in front of you for economic purposes, ergonomic purposes. So positioning is crucial for the eyebrow approach. And that means we elevate the back of the table 15 degrees. And then we have a hyperextension of the head that the zygoma is the highest point. I think that is very important because you want the frontal lobe to fall back by gravity, not by retraction. And then we turn the head different degrees to the chondrolateral side depending on the location of the lesion. If the lesion is more anteriorly located, like an olfactory groove meningiomas, we rotate the head about 45 degrees. If the tumor is uh, tuberculum cellae or the um, middle sphenoid wing, then we rotate less, that means 40, uh, 30 degrees or 25 degrees. So we make the incision directly in the eyebrow. Some people say not, not good because you cut through the uh, root of the hair and then it makes um, a bad cosmetic result, but I cannot confirm this finding. So we just cut within this eyebrow. There are two nerves you have to take care about. This is a supraorbital nerve, which you can, you can feel the fissure here with the fingers and you know what is a, a medial limitations of your craniotomy, and then you have the frontotemporal branch of the facial nerve. A small boho is made behind the superior temporal line, and then the dura is open and with a, a base to the a skull base. So video to show you how we do it. This is the markation of the superior uh, superorbital nerve, then so we make incision of the skin. Sometimes you can identify the nerves and we mobilize it. Then we cut through the periosteum. We create a flap, which, is, which has a base to the skull base and it's retracted there. It's very important that your craniotomy is really flush with the skull base. Then we detach the temporal muscle from the superior temporal line. And it should, should be about two by two centimeters, then it's okay. 
So we place a small borehole behind the super temporal line. You have to be careful that you do not go too deep, otherwise you end up in the orbit. Then the first cut is at the base, and then the second cut goes up, so you get your height. If you make the incision too, as you, if you make the craniotomy too flat, it's not good because you have difficulties to see the skull base, especially in the initial part of the surgery. So the bone flap is elevated. And then another crucial step is that you drill the inner margin of the craniotomy because this gives you a much better view. It's just a few millimeters what you take here, but it's very important to get a good view to the skull base. Also the uh, protuberances on the orbital roof sometimes they are really um, large and you have to drill them away otherwise you cannot see down to the skull base and then you elevate the dura to the base. So that is a pretty easy approach but it must really be very flush with the skull base otherwise you have difficulties to work there. And you see, if you release the CSF after a while, the frontal lobe falls back by gravity and there's not much retraction required. That is the main criticism. What the endonasal guys always say is that we retract too much on the frontal lobe and we have a higher rate of epileptic seizures. But I think that is not true if you position the patient perfectly and you take your time and release CSF. So meningiomas are, of course, a good indication. You see here is the tuberculum cell in meningioma. Some people say you should do an anonasal approach because the tumor is extending into the cellar, but you see the intercarotid distance is not much and there's a mushroom appearance of the tumor. And you see this, this layer is all chiasm. It's really stretched over the tumor. <clears throat> and I was afraid if you come from below that you pull on the tumor and all the chiasm comes down. You see the optical uh, findings, ophthalmological findings were very poor, visual acuity was not good, and you see it's really a tunnel view. This is the opening, so we cut the first step, the uh, falciform ligament, we open the canal if tumor is extending into the canal, but in this case it was not. So we cut the tumor, it was very fibrous, Cusa was not working, this is a crucial step now, you see you have to dissect the arachnoid plane, preserve all the small vessels which supply the optic apparatus, all branches from the superior hypophyseal artery complex should be preserved and the tumor is taken out. And you see with the endoscope, there was no invasion of the canal. This is a pituitary stalk and you see the tumor is coming like a mushroom from the intracellular space. Some grooving on the optic chiasm because of the pressure of the tumor against the anterior cerebral arteries. So we remove the tumor from the intracellular space, tumor was extending into the cavernous sinus. So there's some venous bleeding when we take the tumor out, but you just, we just pack it with Surgicel and then we put some Tachocel on it. So with the endoscope, you can see under the optic nerve, you can see in this blind corner. So there's always a blind corner on the ipsilateral optic nerve and the endoscope is so valuable. You see the size of craniotomy, Patient has a little bit blue eye after surgery. And you see already after three days, marked improvement of the visual field. And after three months, although she has a very small eyebrow, you see the incision is uh, really good. The healing is in general very good in this area. And this is uh, after surgery, complete tumor resection. The risk of visual deterioration is always when you try to get under the ipsilateral optic nerve. This is a the disadvantage of the frontolateral approach. I agree with Marcos. I always use this for frontal skull with meningioma, but people who do the midline approach are right because they can see to both under both optic nerves. And here you cannot see it with a microscope, but we have the endoscope. And with the endoscope, you can nicely look under the optic canal, uh, under the optic nerve, and you can take the tumor out here. And if necessary, we can open up and we can drill the optic canal. The other main indication are optic roof, olfactory roof meningiomas. So when we look, when we show this um, image here for our courses, many people say, yeah, it's a clear indication for endonasal. But I say, no, it's not a good indication for endonasal because you will lose olfaction. And olfaction, in my opinion, it's a very important um, 
sense which should be preserved at all costs, in my opinion. So we make an eyebrow approach. You see this is the right offer to retract. It's involved in the tumor. And you see the difficulty in the olfactory groove meningiomas is to look to the base of the olfactory groove, especially if the olfactory groove is very deep, you cannot see. You cannot see it with a microscope. You need an endoscope to have really an overlook of this area. So olfactory groove meningiomas are a very good example when you use an eyebrow approach that you need an endoscope. So the tumor is detached from the skull base. The tumor is already on the medial side of the right olfactory tract, but can be mobilized. And after the tumor is detached from the skull base, we can remove the tumor and we could preserve even the right olfactory tract and we did not touch the left one because the left one was protect, protected by the arachnoid. So we coagulate the base of the tumor. And then you see here, it's a blind corner. It's not seen under the microscope. So we need a 30 degree endoscope to look here and we can remove the last pieces of tumor, but we did not sacrifice the olfactory nerve. This one day after surgery, five days, again, a little bit blue eye. So after three months, the patient came back to my clinic and I asked the nurses on which side was the incision and they could not tell because in these um, eyebrows, of course, it's uh, ideal to hide the incision. And he's now 10 years out of the surgery and you see no recurrence, although we did not drill the skull with, although we did not resect all of the dura to preserve his olfaction. It was another lady, a young lady came with this small tumor and asked for advice. And I said, yes, you are young. This tumor will grow, will grow to the other side in the future. So we can do it uh, right now. And she said, yes, we do the surgery. And you see again, we cannot look from this small eyebrow incision to the, to the base of the auditory groove. So we need a 30 degree endoscope. And then we need curved instrumentation. And we dissect the tumor from the right of it to retract, so I did not sacrifice it, or, although you may argue you can sacrifice that one, we have the left intact, but I tried to preserve both, and we just remove the tumor, clean the dura, resect the fox a little bit, and then we coagulated the, uh, the dura. And we could also preserve the olfaction on the right side, and as well on the left side. And you see, this is the uh, craniotomy, the surgery. And she's now two years after surgery. Of course, it's too far too early to say, will she get a recurrence or not, of course. So we will follow up her. There was a young man came with this tumor. He had still pretty good smell. So the same approach. You see, this is the right olfactory tract here. We detached the tumor. It was no problem. You could see with a microscope in this area, but here in front, then we need an, an endoscope to look to the side. This is the left olfactory tract. Tumor could be removed and preservation of both of the olfactory nerves and tracts. And here we remove tumor under the fox on the contralateral side under endoscopic visualization. Again, you see the frontal lobe falls back. So there's no really active retraction required to get access to the tumor. And you see for a bald head, the eyebrow incision is really nice. And he was very happy because I explained to him the other choice what we have. And he was very happy that we did the eyebrow approach. And you see here, we could preserve his, uh, his olfaction. And he's now two years after surgery and still no indication for recurrence. But of course we have to observe it. And we had 25 patients with ovary groove meningiomas and we did a transcranial approach and 16 had at least a hyposmia. And in 13 of the 16 uh, nerves, we could, uh, patients, we could preserve smell at least on one side. So I think it's very important. And this is a big advantage compared to the endonasal approach, which I think has no place for ovary groove meningioma except there is a major part of the tumor in the nose and the patient has already lost olfaction. Craniofine jomos, we did a few of them. You see here an old man, he was um, 
uh, uh, fatigue and has decreased performance. He had a little bit pituitary insufficiency. You see this tumor here. Nowadays, I would make an endonasal approach, but you see here, this is a chiasm, and this is a tumor pointing to the lamina terminalis. So we did a lamina terminalis approach by an eyebrow incision. We resect the tumor, but we see here there's complete infiltration of the stalk. It's an intra infundibular tumor, and the patient asks us to keep the stalk if there is a uh, possibility to keep it. And we, we followed his um, wishes and we left it. And of course, he got a, some recurrence. You see, this is after six months, the small remnant here increased in size. So we sent him for fractionated radiotherapy, 54 grays. And this is uh, um, two months later, you see here the remnant of the tumor. This is now 10 years after radiation, the tumor is all, almost gone and he's still good. has no obesity, has no DI and has no visual deficits, but he's panhypopit and needs some uh, supplementation of the hormones. Aneurysm clipping is the last indication I want to show you. Of course, we can do aneurysm clipping via the eyebrow approach. I do it very rarely because the space is limited and you have just one angle of view. That's why for most of the aneurysm, especially the complex ones, I make a frontal lateral approach with a larger craniotomy. You see this aneurysm, synward aneurysm, and we don't see anything from the base of the aneurysm. The optic nerve here is a carotid. And then at first we have to open the dura and then we have to drill a little bit of the anterior clinal process to get access to the base of the aneurysm. The aneurysm is protected by the dura, which was elevated. And then we dissect, cut the dura here, and then we get access to the carotid in front of the aneurysm. We excise the dura. And then with endoscopic, 30 degree endoscope, we see here down the first lateral branch, you see the steer communicating artery, and we can look as the carotid. This is the base of the aneurysm here. So we get an impression, optic nerve here. So to bring the aneurysm in a clippable form, we shrink the aneurysm with bipolar coagulation because we have always a problem with the ascular clips. They do not open widely enough. It's sometimes difficult to get the aneurysm in the clip, especially in this case, we cannot use a straight clip or a, a banana clip, but we have to use a right angled one and then the opening is not very good. So we see here we mobilize the arachnoid from the carotid. And then we have here the clip applier in and we clip it, but you see during closure of the clip, the clip slips up and leaves a large portion of the aneurysm outside. This is a wall already, but here is a lot of, of aneurysm sac remaining. So I have now I took another angulated clip behind the first one, but you see it's very limited the movement of the clip applier. That's why in most cases, we, we don't use the eyebrow approach for aneurysms because you have more freedom to, to handle the clip applier and to move it to some there in, in the other directions. Just to show you that it's an option also for clipping of an aneurysm. So what is about the cosmesis? Marcus said the cosmesis is not so good, but I disagree strongly with him. We had some problems if we did not close the gap which we created with the craniotome, especially in ladies with a very thin um, uh, scalp. Then you see really after some months when the scar starts to shrink, you can really see the outline of the craniotomy. And that's why what we do now is that we closed really all the, all the uh, defect in the bone created by the craniotome with bone cement. And then we have really a good cosmetic result. We see, especially in, in, in men with a bald head, it's an ideal uh, indication. Um, sometimes you really, it's hard to see where is the incision made. Even in women, you see here, this is the incision, although there's no eyebrow, hard to uh, recognize, recognize it. First day after surgery, there's some swelling, of course. 
but then three months later, you see she can move the eyebrow very nicely. And again, you see this is the incision. So usually the eyebrow incision gives a very good appealing cosmetic and real result. So my conclusion is that the superorbital approach via an eyebrow incision is a minimally invasive skull based approach. Endoscope assistance is a must for many cases because they are blind corners. And the endoscope is a, a valuable adjunct to microsurgery. So I can recommend this for certain indications. I think it's a really a nice approach and many of the patients are really happy with it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Henry. You show us again another way to think or to handle, handle those, uh, those lesions in such area. I have also some questions for you, but maybe, maybe at the end. Yeah. Normally, Sebastian Foolish uh, was with us uh, this afternoon, but he has to apologize. And for sure, we will not blame him, him since he is always present and very active for the section. It will be for the next time for sure that he will be with us. So we move now to Lyon to listen to Professor Emmanuel Joanneau on the indications of cavernous sinus for pituitary adenomas. Please, Emmanuel. The French connection is there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's work. Okay, you can see? Not yet. Um, yes. That's good now? Yes, it's yes, now it's fine. Okay, so um, we will, uh, good, good evening, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be here with you. And I will talk with, uh, I will focus my talk on pituitary adenoma and uh, the role of the, 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 the cavernous sinosurgery for this kind of uh, a tumor. So no disclosure. Uh, the pituitary surgery, it's a long journey. Um, I mean, the first attempt to remove a pituitary uh, tumor uh, was at the, at the uh, late 90s with uh, Sir William Horsley, it was the first British neurosurgeon. And uh, it was a great success for, the, for this time, so this period of time, because of the patients had only a biopsy and survived two weeks. After, there is a lot of improvements, a lot of great and famous neurosurgeons. Everybody knows uh, the work uh, uh, of Ave Cushing that start to use in US uh, the transpedominal roots. He gave up uh, because he, he had a lot of uh, complications, CSF leak and meningitis. And this, uh, this approach uh, was reintroduced in France by uh, General Griot in uh, Paris. And uh, the next step, uh, the next uh, progress come with, uh, uh, came for, uh, with uh, uh, Jules Hardy uh, that introduced the microscope in this kind of uh, transphenomenal approach. So, now, uh, you all know that uh, since uh, more than uh, two decades now, uh, it's uh, the endoscopic era for such uh, surgery. I take the opportunity to, uh, to uh, thank all my uh, mentor in the, that trained me and teach me for this uh, surgery. I start with a microscope and I shift with the endoscope and I want uh, uh, to thank uh, uh, Edward Laws um, Paolo Capabianca, uh, Angel Bank Knox. Um, it was all my mentor with, uh, for this, uh, this surgery. So uh, it's a benign tumor. Uh, most of the pituitary uh, tumor, the, the pituitary adenoma, are benign. And there is uh, now a debate around the name of uh, the, the pituitary adenoma. I mean, uh, now we change a little bit the name because the histologists were not so satisfied for uh, the name uh, of adenoma. So you will have to uh, look at the, in the literature uh, with the old name, pituitary adenoma, and now the new name is the pituitary neuroendocrine uh, tumor. It's, it's good for everybody. Yes, it is. Okay. 
So it's benign tumor, but often invasive tumor. I mean, when you look at the literature, around one third uh, of the, 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 the pituitary adenoma, the pit net uh, tumor invade, uh, are invasive, invading the, the sphenoid uh, space or invading also uh, the, the paracellar locations. So invasions uh, can uh, be for uh, um, the sphenoid and uh, like in this case of uh, somatotroph adenoma and when you remove such a tumor, it's, uh, you, you have to remove the tumor but you have to enlarge the radiation uh, to the, the, the bone clivus uh, and uh, also to remove, I, I can be more fast here, to remove the dural bag uh, not only the tumor, if you want to cure the patients, you have to enlarge your surgery. So it's not so uh, difficult. Here is the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. You remove the pituitary, the dural bag at the inferior part. But you have to see to, to enlarge, not only to remove the pituitary adenoma inside the cella. And uh, the most difficult is the topic of the, the day is the cavernous sinus invasion. And I like uh, very much uh, this picture because that show you how teeny is the medial wall of the cavernous sinus that explain why uh, it's so easy for the, the, the adenoma to get inside uh, the cavernous sinus. So here is the picture that uh, previously uh, show you uh, uh, Timothy. Uh, you have the pituitary fossa, the pituitary gland, you are inside the sphenoid sinus. You have the uh, cavernous sinus loop of the, the ICA. And uh, uh, here is uh, the lateral uh, compartment of the, the, the cavernous sinus. And you have two uh, approach for the cavernous sinus. When you get through the nose, you come through, through the nose. There is a medial approach. You use the, 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 the pituitary windows. And or you can, be, uh, you can use a more lateral approach to the cavernous sinus, lateral to the ICA. It's not uh, the same risk, not the same surgery. So to uh, check the invasion of the cavernous sinus, the most useful classifications is the coronal classifications of uh, angel back knobs. You all know that uh, that classification is based on the carotid line. And uh, uh, the um, uh, cavernous sinus invasion is conversely uh, related to the, uh, the grades of the, of the, 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 the the, the KNOPS classifications uh, and uh, the, the invasions uh, start to be very uh, frequent, uh, starting uh, from uh, two to three uh, A. Uh, that uh, means that the tumor uh, gets uh, lateral through uh, the, the lateral line, the lateral carotid line. Uh, there is a subclassification of three B. Uh, the tumor gets below, uh, invite the cavernous sinus below the carotid. And uh, when you have, sorry, when you have tumor surrounding the tumor, it's grade four, and there is 100% of uh, um, uh, uh, cavernous sinus invasion. So it's a very useful classification. There is some debate because it's not so easy uh, to uh, separate some time grad two and grad three e and uh, uh, it's don't take into account an important point uh, for me that uh, you don't have any axial view and you you um, underestimate uh, the posterior cavernous sinus invasions that's important as well so what's being more aggressive for pituitary adenoma? Because you have medical drugs, you have radiotherapy that work well. Uh, so uh, you can just uh, satisfy your very simple surgery. You remove as much as possible of the tumor. You keep in place of pieces of the tumor and you treat after uh, with a medical drug or radiotherapy. But the, the, there is uh, some points, important points. Only surgery rapidly cure the patients. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a very important point of view uh, when you deal with uh, acromegalic patients, when you deal with corticotroph uh, Cushing uh, patients. 
so the surgery is the first uh, harm you have to, to use uh, to rapidly cure the patient. There is no curative drugs uh, and radiotherapy, uh, especially for functioning and secreting pituitary adenoma take times. And sometimes you have resistance to the, uh, therapy. When you look at uh, acromegalic patients, uh, medical drugs only work uh, around half of the patient and it takes uh, a time. So uh, it's very interesting to consider to cure rapidly the patients, uh, not to, uh, to keep them with uh, their disease for, for months or for years. And uh, also it's very expensive and uh, uh, for drugs or radiotherapy, uh, you have a better efficiency in smaller like targets, like in this case, uh, there is an um, invasion of the cavernous sinus. We decide to use medical drug one year after the patient uh, is not uh, cured. And there is uh, still a, a huge tumor inside uh, the, the, the cellar and the parcellar space. We decide to operate the patient. The patient was not cured for sure. But one month after the surgery uh, with medical drug, the patient was cured. So. Uh, uh, even if the case, uh, if you cannot cure the patient, the surgery uh, uh, can benefit for patients. So you have a medial approach to the cavernous sinus. You have, it's uh, pretty easy, uh, like in this case, a huge non-functioning pituitary adenoma. You use the pituitary uh, windows. Uh, you remove uh, the cellar part of the tumor, the supracellar part of the tumor. Uh, in most of the, the case, the, the pituitary uh, tissue is soft uh, tissue, so you can get inside, you follow the tumor, you can get inside the, the cavernous sinus with two suction techniques, you, you can turn around the carotid and uh, uh, with a, a, a little risk, very small risk. So it's the medial approach, sometimes you can have, like in this case, a somatotroph uh, adenoma, uh, you have a, a hole uh, at the level of the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, you, you uh, enlarge the hole, you get inside the cavernous sinus. And uh, um, now, with, uh, since uh, a few years, we try to improve our results uh, with uh, more experience. And uh, like in this case, probably there is a, um, a microscopic invasion of the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, so you can remove the tumor and after splits the medial wall of the cavernous sinus to remove the medial wall of the cavernous sinus try to in, improve our results. So the medial approach is a good approach. Uh, and sometimes you have to do that and you have to, uh, to operate inside the cavernous sinus. Like in this case, it was a colleague with a corticotroph adenoma. The pituitary uh, adenoma was inside the cavernous sinus. So he, we remove the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, we get inside. Here is the six now at the end. So uh, it's the only way and the only means to, to cure the patients. So when you look at the results uh, for the medial approach to the cavernous sinus, it's um, uh, it's a foreground free tumor, the, 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 the tumor that start to, to be invasive for the cavernous sinus. Uh, when you look at the results, sometimes it's, the, I put here two papers with impressive results, uh, the one uh, from Diego. And uh, sometimes it's very impressive. You can at least cure or have gross total removal around 17%. Uh, the gross total removal is uh, more easy to, uh, to, uh, to get, to have, because uh, you just, uh, um, just to check your post-operative MRI, and sometimes you don't see uh, any tumor remnant. But for secreting adenoma, when you look at the endocrine remissions, uh, it's less impressive. I mean, even uh, if you try to be more aggressive, uh, you will not be able to cure uh, more than uh, around uh, half of the patient for grad free, and uh, for free beats, the best results uh, come from the, the Diego uh, series. But in most of the case, uh, we were not able to cure uh, grad free B uh, pituitary adenoma. So aggressive surgery for free. Uh, grad free uh, tumor when you use the medial approach is defendable, but only with strain certain and 
some time, uh, sorry, uh, like in this case, the pituitary adenoma was inside the media wall of the cavernous sinus. It uh, was a, a, a free A, and you can sometimes you have a good anatomical uh, um, condition, so you can split the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. Here is the carotid, and to remove the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, you could, and it's more easy. It's more difficult for grad three B just below. It's probably uh, the, the explanation of why uh, you will not be able to cure. Uh, uh, 3B uh, when there is an evasion uh, grad 3B. So it's not the same surgery when you start and you want to, to walk lateral uh, to the uh, ICA. I mean, it's uh, the, the approach you have to use for grad 4 uh, uh, pituitary adenoma. And uh, uh, for grad 4, there is a tumor all around the, the carotid, and uh, uh, you need to uh, use the medial approach, the pituitary windows, but you use also, you, you have to uh, also walk uh, laterally to the ICA. And when you look at the, the results, even, even in the most expert end, it's very disappointing in, in most of the series, you will not cure the patients. So like in this case, it was uh, uh, not a regular pituitary case. You walk on both sides of the, 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 the ICA. It was a very uh, tricky and firm tumor. Uh, at the end, the, the result was not uh, that uh, uh, that bad, but it's very uh, high risky surgery. You have the carotid here and you walk on both sides. So it's not regular pituitary surgery. So when you try to summarize uh, the, the, the result, uh, you can, uh, patient can benefit from more aggressive surgery with a medial approach. When you look at 3A, uh, Knops uh, uh, pituitary adenoma with uh, around half of uh, or a little bit more uh, patients that uh, are um, uh, that have a, a gross total removal uh, at the, the, the postoperative MRI or uh, with endocrine uh, remissions. But for grad 3B, the, the results are clearly disappointing. And uh, uh, there is no real uh, patient cure uh, with aggressive surgery in grad four. And uh, you have to to be uh, aware also that uh, even uh, when you start to uh, walk lateral to the carotid, you will put uh, uh, you will take risk with uh, the optic nerve, and you will you will have optic nerve palsy, sometimes transitory. Uh, optic nerve palsy or permanent optic nerve palsy, and uh, you will start uh, dealing with vascular problem to ICA for sure. It's rare, but it uh, uh, can happen when you uh, turn around the carotid, and sometimes it's uh, not an uh, uh, arterial uh, issue. It's, it can be, uh, sorry, like this, venous issue, and you when you start to have a such a, a venous uh, hemorrhage, it's uh, become very difficult uh, to be to discriminate the, the adenoma from the, the pituitary and the surrounding uh, tumor uh, tissue. So high risk in grad four, high risk for a firm tumor when you start uh, dealing and uh, walk uh, lateral to the carotid, and high risk also uh, for radio surgery. So you have to be safe for patients. I mean, the, the dead come message will be uh, probably you can be more aggressive when you are trained enough for grad 3A. Uh, and the results start to be uh, very disappointing for grad 3B and uh, uh, for sure for grad 4. And you, you have to think that you have uh, additional treatments and radiotherapy that work well. And sometimes you have drugs that it's not curative drug, but you have medical drug that work also. So don't be too uh, uh, don't don't take too, too too much risk for the patients. It's not the same. Uh, we are talking about regular pituitary surgery and regular pituitary uh, tumor. It's not the same uh, uh, concern and the same issue when you look at uh, this kind of tumor, recurrent tumor, atypical or anaplastic. And uh, for sure, the 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 the, the surgery uh, will be more risky. 
but it's not the same situation. It's another story. When you start dealing with carotid, you have to prepare your surgery in case of vascular uh, injuries. You have to monitor the, the cranial nerve. It's, in my hand, uh, a little bit disappointing, this kind of monitoring. You, are, you can use if you have uh, um, intraoperative magnetic uh, resonance. But of this kind of surgery, um, you will have a dedicated skull base. Uh, when you push your surgery inside the cavernous sinus, you need to be trained enough. Don't start with this kind of uh, pituitary uh, uh, surgery. So the take a message for paracellar surgery, you need to be a pituitary surgeon trained enough in expert center. It's the message all over the world. And uh, for pit nets, um, you can push your surgery a little bit more, especially with endoscopic technique. It's probably uh, beneficial for patients for grad 3E, questionable for grad 3B, and no real indication for grad 4. Uh, for sure, it's more complicated uh, when you deal with recurrent on firm uh, pit net tumor. And it's a case per case discussions. So I will finish with the sentence of Hippocrat, do uh, only what you are training for and stay safe for patients, especially when you deal with uh, um, uh, benign tumor and uh, when you have uh, radiotherapy technique or medical drugs. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, for your very nice talk. Very interesting as usual. And uh, we do part of my job now, since I have to introduce uh, Diego Mazatenta from Bologna. Please, Diego, I think uh, Emmanuel Joano has uh, already detailed your experience and results. I'm happy to listen to you now on the endoscopic approach to Michael's cave and uh, infotemporal for such tumors. Please, Diego. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for your invitation. Um, it's uh, more easy for me to speak about uh, uh, metal caves uh, and um, and the uh, infratemporal fossa after the uh, very interesting presentation of Emmanuel, because as you know, the infratemporal fossa, metal cave, and cavernous sinus are the more lateral approaches you can uh, use when you choose the endoscopic technique, like the Pittsburgh group described more than 50 years ago. As you know very well, this is an extreme lateral approach transnasally, and are obviously uh, there are not uh, an answer for all problems. The endoscopic technique and the endonasal approach remains a tools. So it's very important to choose the correct tools when you uh, allow a good results. Which the view? The, this is the view of transectomidal sampterigoid view. It's completely different. It's always transnasal, but it's not. Uh, really in the midline of the sphenoidal sinus. When you choose to work laterally to the pterygoid process using the transectomidal approach, you change completely your point of view and you work in front of the internal carotid artery. If you work in the Meckel case, cavernous sinus, infratemporal fossa, you work in front of the internal carotid artery. Your midline is not midline of anatomy. This is the pituitary gland. Take in your mind when you choose these approaches. The anatomy is very complex because there are a lot of uh, structures, vascular and uh, nerves that run in front of the, your window, in the ventral window. So choose this way when the tumors sometimes created the street for the surgeon. It's a very important to the, this uh, uh, message. In case of you decide to use to gain access in this area, it's important to perform a complete maxillectomy to open widely and frontally the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, closing and cutting the maxillary artery and open widely to gain access in this area, as you can see in this early post-op CT scan. Obviously, it's very important to know very well the anatomy of this region. This is a, a, a cadaver uh, spacement. You can see after the bone, all the vascular and, neuro and neurological structure you can meet if you choose this ventral approach. This is a great wing, we one, two, three, internal carotid artery, and complete the region posterior to the world of the maxillary sinus. 
It's important to, to understand that there are two main techniques, the free hands techniques and the two hands techniques with the endoscope fixed by the holder, like Professor Schroeder, uh, Professor Schroeder showed before, also in the uh, supraorbital keyhole approach uh, using the endoscopic technique. This is our series in infratemporal force I started very early, and also there are a lot of type of tumor. As you can see, there are uh, the, the half part are well benign and the 44% are malign. So the endoscopic uh, in approach to infratemporal force can be useful also for biopsy in case of uh, malignant tumor or to study before the tumor. These tools can be useful in different surgical strategies. One step, single purely endoscopic endonasal approach, one step combined endoscopic with uh, craniotomic or transcervical approach in the same sitting or multi stages procedure. You can start with endoscopic and after following the carrying on in the different time after the several weeks, craniotomic or transcervical. Obviously, in this case, it's important to prepare the ORR in, with the all devices. We use the two high definition screen because there is a very important also the ergonomic position for the two surgeon. In endoscopic technique, it doesn't exist the first and the second. The assistance is a real second surgeon. And it's most important to see better and work easily with a good, uh, comfortable position. Obviously, the high speed drill, the microbe Doppler, the laser, and the shiver with the intraoperative monitoring of the cranial nerves is mandatory in this case. This is a case of uh, uh, V2 schwannoma. Uh, we treated with by only endoscopic endonasal approach in one step. As you can see, this is the, the tumor located intra extracranially, and we achieved these results with the purely endoscopic endonasal. As you can see, this was performed ectomedectomy, opening widely the posterior, uh, the, um, the medial wall of uh, maxillary sinus, just to control the posterior part of maxillary sinus itself. Another case, this is a V3 schwannoma, but it's a, the tumor was located a little below in the floor of the medial uh, fossa. So we choose to combine in the same step, in the same procedure, double approach, endoscopic endonasal, a transcervical approach. Using a very little incision transcervical, it was pos possible to control the ventral dome in the front of the, in the endoscopic technique, sorry, by using an endoscopic technique, a free hands technique, and also control laterally, transcervical, the mid, the lateral part of the tumor. This is was the results, and this was the MRI after three years of follow-up. The infratemporal fossa can be useful in uh, multi-stage procedures. This is a meningiomas, intra-extracranial meningiomas, in a uh, 55 years uh, female. The patient was affected by intracranial hypertension in the epilepsy. Obviously, we start with the craniotomic approach, trans, um, transtemporal approach, to remove and relieve the hyperintention. As you can see, remains the component in the cavernous sinus and the infratemporal fossa. The midline is recovered and the patient uh, resource is hyperintention. Secondary, we remove the, uh, intra, the component of uh, infratemporal fossa using the transphenoidal purely endoscopic approach. Remains the cavernous sinus, we decide in multi therapy strategies to treat by radiosurgery. The other approach is a medical case. There are so many uh, surgical approach have been described. And uh, Kassam in 2009 described the ventral approach to a cavernous sign uses the, mid, the, using the lateral approach of, uh, of uh, paranasal sinuses using endoscopic technique. Obviously, this is an option. It could be not uh, uh, the results, the answer for all the problems. When you use, 
we started in 2002 to use this type of approach for a benign schwannoma of the sinusoidal tract and tidal palatine fossa, and we published always uh, we published 20 years ago. We continue to use in very few cases, very limited indication. Uh, just to 2000, 2020, we arrived to collect uh, 15 cases. The large part are near, were neuromas, and a good uh, um, a high percentage was chondrosarcoma and uh, epidermal cyst. We published our results three years ago. Like the infratemporal fossa, we were completely in front of the internal carotid artery. And we can show with the schema the uh, portion of bone you have to remove by drilling to expose more laterally the pterygoid process. As you can see with this uh, uh, 3D uh, schema, the, the part of bone has been removed, closure of maxillary artery, you can see there the um, vidian nerve, and this is the view frontally, ventrally, of the ganglion, of gastric ganglion, and view two, V3. This is the images of the point of view of the endoscope, a zero degree endoscope, not angulate endoscope, in front of the cavum mecca. You can see the paraclival tract, you can see the future V2, sorry, uh, our nerves. You can see also the six cranial nerves. And this is the uh, pterygoid canal drill out when run the uh, vidian nerve. It arrived, it arrived in front of the GU of carotid artery before it became uh, paraclival. This is the window, but the, cover, the, the metal cage is a, a, a different angulation, and you work around and laterally to carotid artery in this direction. So it's very important to check the position of a paraclival tract of carotid artery because it is the, your medial uh, part of your surgical corridor. In case of your, uh, in your case, the, the, paracly the paraclival tract of the internal carotid artery is uh, medialized by the tumor of a normal anatomical condition, you have to abandon this route because it's impossible to work more laterally in case of lateralization of the internal carotid artery. In this anatomical dissection, we can see the opening the uh, ventrally, the uh, Meckel's caves. This is the carotid artery, six cranial nerve. This is the anterior part of uh, Meckel's caves. You can see the opening the ventrally, the Meckel's cave, without empty, without any tumor. You recognize the fiber of the uh, trigeminal nerves. And uh, you can follow the fiber, the trigeminal nerves, until the porous and gain access in the, the posterior fossa, as you can see with this uh, instrument. This is the trajectory of your surgery. This is very important. Don't uh, uh, forget this. You work around and laterally of the internal carotid artery. This step, when you open widely, the lateral part of the bundle sphenoidal sinus, drilling out the pterygoid process. This is the carotid artery, this is the clivus, this is the V2 coagulated and opening the ventrally the uh, cavum mecca. You uh, perform a skin excision and you can see the tumor inside of the cavernous uh, of the mecal cave push up. Which are the Meckel's cave primary tumors, very rare cases, meningiomas, trigeminal neuromas, epidermoid cyst. Less than 0.5% of the intracranial tumors are located purely in Meckel case, very rare cases. But this approach could be useful combined with the different strategies. I show you the Meckel's cave schanoma purely to show you the different time. This is the nasal phase preparing the approach. As you can see, the endoscope is in other hands. This is the closer and cutting of uh, maxillary artery. You can see the prepare the uh, pterygoid process, the drilling out, 
This is the sphenoidal sinus. This is the carotid artery. They check with the narrow navigation and after the bone removal with the micro dropper probe is very crucial. It's a mandatory in this type of surgery. And now we remove the lateral part of the bone. You can see the cutting. And now the, the endoscope is fixed by the holder. The tumor removal is, uh, is achieved with the same technique of a microsurgical. Two hands, two instrumentation, and the tumor removal could be achieved using the, uh, uh, the window created also by the tumor. Enlarge the bone and the dura mater. At the hand, this is the tumor removal was achieved. At the hand, we control the TF slate with the fat. If you need, you can use also a piece of bone to control. And after, in this case, we put a free flap of middle turbinate before preparing. And this is the MRI postoperatively. This is another case of uh, Meckel's curve meningiomas, purely endoscopically. And this is of the Meckel's curve epidermoid. But in this case, for example, it was uh, in an intra extracranial tumor in 25 years old woman at the 35th weeks of pregnancy. This was very difficult case. The patient uh, was addressed in an emergency unit because there is any other intention. As you can see, the a very important edema uh, frontotemporal parietal lobe also. And you can see three parts of the tumor, extra cranial intranasally, cavernous sinus cavumecal, and the medial compartment of the uh, medial fossa. We start uh, with combined approach, transnasally and transcranially, and we prepare the uh, procedure for combined approach in the same procedure. We are not sure what this type of uh, tumor could be. Obviously, the patient uh, underwent a cesarean delivery before 12 to 36 hours before of the hour uh, surgical, neurosurgical procedure. We start endoscopically and nasally. We prepare the, the approach, as you can see, this is the, the component of the tumor located in the paranasal uh, sinuses. We can see in this part the use of uh, free hands technique because it's more useful in this uh, narrow space. The tumor was a bleeding tumor, but the control was achieved uh, in all uh, condition. You can see the drilling out of the pterygoid process enlarge in front of cavernous sinus, pituitary gland, paraclival tract, and drill out of the extreme part of lateral uh, bone of sphenoidal sinus. We remove, we check intraoperatively, the, the, I'm sorry, this is the, um, the uh, flow seal, the hemostatic engine. We drill out all of the, uh, the the, the bone, and we start with the tumor removal in front of the uh, Meckel's caves. We continue the tumor removal and the follow the tumor in the medial uh, fossa, canal fossa. This is the brain tumor, the brain of the mid of the um, temporal lobe, medial part of temporal lobe, and we find an uh, extraaxial lesion and it's possible to dissect from the brain. We continue to bypass meal tumor removal, and the end, this was the temporal low. We control the hemostasis, we close the fat. In this case, we have prepared the pedical flap from the uh, nasal septum. And this is, was a uh, result postoperatively. The, um, the anatomopathological issue described a microscope hemangioma. Also, this type of surgery, the cavum meckel, could be 
useful in multi-stage strategy in, uh, in uh, this case of uh, trigeminal uh, neuronomas, uh, we choose to perform before, obviously, the, uh, the craniectomy, the retrosigmoid craniectomy. After we perform the uh, transphenoidal approach to remove the uh, part of the tumor located in, in Meckel's caves, and uh, this is, was the uh, results post early post transphenoid. Don't forget that there is the tumor can be uh, raising, uh, invading the Meckel's cave. It's very common to uh, find chordomas and chondrosarcoma like adenocystic carcinoma. And they are more frequent than primary tumors. So the endoscopic endonasal technique could be a, a good, oh, sorry, this is a, a problem of mine. This is the uh, control, the late control of the, uh, the um, uh, trigeminal neuroma, sorry. The delayed after three years. In case of the tumor invading and enlarge the uh, the cavumecal, the endoscopic endonasal approach could be useful to remove in this part. And this is the chondrosarcoma, as you can see, the follow up, and this is the control after four years of a follow up. What does it mean? In our experience and conclusion, the endoscopic approach to infratemporal fossa and mecal curve are the good surgical option in minimal invasive treatment. Obviously, the multiple disciplinary strategy is mandatory, allowing good results in terms of quality of life and survival right. Don't forget the endoscopy is a tool and not an answer for all the problems of the skull base. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Diego. Very interesting. I hope you will join us uh, in the future or so <laughs> for other seminars we organize. So I think we Thank have you. this afternoon have an incredible overview of uh, all the possibility to, to reach parasitic tumors, either to uh, supraorbital, transferiary, frontolateral, octagonal, with or without, orbitozygomantic craniotomy, endoscopic transcranial, endoscopic transmaxillary, transmaxillary, a lot of variation. It means that we have to, to, masters, all, all, to master all the techniques as much as possible to ma And it will give any, a lot of modalities to access this, this area. Do you have any questions? I've got one question to Diego. Is my, my yeah. um, when you go to the uh, Meckel's cave uh, via transnasal approach, do you have to pass the cavernous sinus? No, in primary tumors, you work medially inferior to cavernous sinus. Your enter point is between the V2 and paraclaval tract. And so you work more inferiorly in the cavernous sinus. Conversely, when the tumor invading the, the Meckel's cave uh, frequently is located also in cavernous sinus. And uh, it remains the, obviously the double approach is an approach of uh, laterally to cavernous sinus. If you sometimes the ventral dome of tumor invading both district, cavernous sinus and uh, cavumecal. And it depends on which type of tumor you're in front of. But in the purely, you can touch the cavernous sinus, you work below and laterally. I understand. Yeah, because uh, usually if it's a trigeminal schwannoma, for instance, I, I use uh, frequently the epidural, uh, pyranal epidural approach. If it's a dumbbell shape, if it's a dumbbell shape, uh, as in your last case you have shown, I go uh, retrosig as you have demonstrated, but then I, at the end of the removal, I put the endoscope, I use the Capabianca uh, instruments to um, remove the tumor within the, the, the Meckel's cave from behind, you know, because usually the Meckel's cave is enlarged. 
and we have a lot of space. So this way we avoid uh, a second approach, but, <clears throat> but uh, we are not using the, um, the transnasal approach to the, um, to the Meckel's cave uh, for the reasons not to come in trouble with carotid, with cavernous sinus and with this kind of structures. Yeah. I agree. In fact, uh, the primary tumors located purely in the Meckel's caves uh, are very few cases. Sometimes we follow the, the major are chordomas and chondrosarcomas. And uh, there are a soft tumor, not so well uh, um, vascularized, and uh, you can mobilize the carotid artery because you are completely, the tumor remodeled completely the skull base. You are not bone, and so it's more easy to manage the carotid artery. And because the carotid artery is not fixed by the bone and the other structures, but it's very few cases. The take home message is a, a tool very limited with a very limited indication. In effect, it's the finally of the webinar. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Diego, ju just one comment. The Maker Cave is a virtual space, and uh, in fact, it, uh, you can uh, only use this this space when the the, the tumor open uh, the, the the space to walk through. Um, so, coming from the nose, I I, I did uh, some case also. Uh, that depends of the the the, the way the, the tumor push the the, the oculomotor nerve on the on the trigeminal nerve. Uh, like for a chondrosarcoma or chordoma, uh, the, the, the tumor uh, push away laterally um, the, 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 the nerve and it's beneficial for patient to come through the nose, not intracranially. For neurinoma, uh, it depends. Uh, when it's, uh, I, I have a huge uh, V2 uh, neurinoma uh, that gets through through the nose and the, the pterygo pterygoid uh, maxillary space, and it was a, a good way to remove the tumor. But when it gets uh, uh, posteriorly uh, in the petrous apex, I'm not sure because you cannot control the relationship uh, with the the, the five uh, nerve uh, fiber. And the relationship uh, with the the the, um, the mesencephalum, yeah. so it can be um, uh, difficult or it can be dangerous to, uh, to trying to uh, to attract the tumor, and you can attract and uh, you can damage the the, the brain state. Uh, I, I rather prefer the the intracranial uh, approach uh, with cavazé or uh, a retrosig approach. Yeah. Well, thank you for these comments, uh, particularly for the trigeminal schwannomas, which are really inside the metal scape. If it's a type A, that means anterior one, then um, uh, I feel it's so easy to go epidurally and, uh, and we peel the dura and we are exactly inside and we have nothing to do with the other structures. But of course, it... Um, uh, uh, a skin incision is necessary, a craniotomy is necessary, but it's not, it's not a big one, it's just uh, we go subtemporal. Yeah. Well, so. probably the, the best indication coming from the nose is that the, the, the neurinoma uh, and the V2 neurinoma that get inside the, 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 the pterygo maxillary space. Yes. The, the other one, it's more uh, controversial. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, we we need to to master all the the, the approach and the epidural approach, uh, like Professor Tadajiba speak about, is probably the best. But you, you have to deal with the the five uh, the the fifth fiber. Yes. And if for these phenomena locating um, on the pterygonal uh, fossa, infratemporal fossa. Uh, what do you think about the transmaxillary approach? We have used in some cases uh, opening the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. It's actually not transnasal, but transmaxillary approach. 
Do we have experience with that? No, because we use uh, the transnasally, if you understand your question, we use uh, the transnasally to avoid the skin, not classical transmaxillary. Yeah, yeah but we use a sublabial uh, incision. Yeah. Yes, but we use uh, with the success the endoscope. And I show you, it's not necessary when you work uh, in the infratemporal fossa, it's not mandatory to use always the 30 degree. I think that when you use the endoscope endonasally and you work medially, I, uh, uh, avoiding the skin incision, this is easy to come back from, it comes from the transphenoidal microsurgical approach. And then we abandoned 20 years ago. So it's important to perform very well the maxillectomy. It's needed also to cut the nasolacrimal duct to gain more la medially spa lateral space. This is most important. This is the classic uh, medial maxillectomy transnasally. And in our experience, the, the patient don't, didn't complain uh, a lot of problems from this approach because there are no skin incision and then it's important to reconstruct the nasolacrimal duct if you remove the anterior part of the maxillary sinus, the medial wall. This is very important. And you replace also the inferior turbinate. To gain access medially, it's enough to cut the middle turbinate and opening the ethmoid. It's enough. No more requiring. Yeah, but pro probably we are not uh, 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 talking about the same point. Uh, we can open the anterior maxillary sinus without uh, being involved with the um, lacrimal duct. So opening the anterior and then the posterior wall, and we are yeah. immediately direct um, at this space behind the maxillary sinus. So some schwannomas we have approached with this way, it was, um, uh, my impression was uh, it was a good one, yeah. But you, you, you mm -hmm. get the same using the transnasal. Absolutely. Maybe. Mm. Uh, when bladder tumor is too far, too lateral, close to the ITM, I mean, um, um, I, I use both approach, uh, uh, endonasal approach, and sometimes transmaxillary approach with a, a small bone flap. You put the endoscope, you remove the posterior part of the medial, uh, of the maxillary sinus, and uh, you, you can be more lateral. And I use uh, sometimes in huge neurinoma and sometimes in, uh, also in inferior extension of meningioma. Um, that could be useful. It's not, it's not so, it's, it's quite easy because you, you just have a, a skin mucosa incision, you do a bone flap and after whatever the, the tools you want to use, I, I rather prefer to use the endoscope, but uh, yeah. it's, it's not that bad. And to control the lat very lateral part of the tumor, um, it's, uh, yeah. it's a good option. Yeah. Because when you come from the nose, you need to enlarge uh, to get uh, access to the lateral part. And um, it's probably more in aggressive and invasive. Mm -hmm. uh, that's yes. Manuel, that's very, very this, few and rare indications. Yeah. This is what we called in the past transantral approach, transantral. Uh, but we are people from the past because <laughs> obviously <laughs> it's over for more than 20 years, Diego said. Uh, <laughs> just, just to move back to the presentation of Diego, uh, I, I do believe that uh, each, each approach carries its own risk. And multiplying the approach for this kind of uh, dumbbell-shaped tumors while uh, uh, the retro SIG, as said Marcos, or the Kawase approach, can manage both components in the same approach uh, means that you reduce the risk of a, a double approach. And I guess that once you can uh, do the job using one single approach, it's probably better than doing an endonasal and transcranial approach. This is my view, and I do agree with the uh, guys like Marcos. But we are, Marcos, we are all generation now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no country for old men. <laughs> oh, I must come back. I must come back to Marseille. <laughs>
to shift a little the discussion, Henry, you show you very nice cases of uh, aneurysm clipping. I try as much as possible to minimize the, the craniotomy, but uh, to endoscope assisted clipping, uh, I'm a little afraid if you have a complication or how to handle a, a massive bleeding, controlling the vessel and, and so forth. Have you had any experience? Have you facing such situation or not? Unfortunately not, but as I said, it's very rare that we make an eyebrow incision for aneurysms, especially in acute cases, I would never do it. And only if it's a, an aneurysm, but you, where you think you can get it easily. But even in this case, I had problems because the clip applier is a little bit yes. bulky. Mm -hmm. And then you have seen, I could not get the first clip behind the other one. Mm -hmm. And this was a little bit risky because I had to mobilize or had to, I had to move the first clip a long distance so I get behind that clip to place the second one. So I think for aneurysms, I know people, um, um, they do a lot of aneurysms, even MCA aneurysms from the eyebrow. But I always, in, in most cases, like Marcus said, I make a frontolateral. It's, it's, it's the same incision. It's the same uh, craniotomy, a little bit larger, and it goes a little bit higher. So that you have a better view down to the skull base. Yes, the incision true. behind there, and many people say, no, it's always an atrophy of the temporalis muscle. I bet if you take care of the nerves and vessels supplying the muscle and you don't need to uh, use too much retraction on the flap, then I think you can have an acceptable result. Yeah, I, I would like to confirm what Henry is saying. The greatest advantage of the frontal approach in comparison to pterional approach is that you don't detach the temporal muscle. You open just at the area where you put your bowhole. The whole approach is medial to the uh, temporal line. So the, uh, the, so the, the muscle remains almost completely on the place. This is the greatest advantage. Exactly. And if you check people using pterional approach, if you watch the videos, you are going to see that they are using the frontal part of the pterional approach. Actually, the temporal part is not used. If you observe the videos, you will confirm that. Yeah. Yeah. This is the MCA aneurysm. popularized by Pernetsky, no? Yeah. I do agree, but the maneuverability, as said Henry, is limited. And uh, once using your, your esculap clips, because I do agree that the opening angle of, of the esculaps are very limited. And I, I'm surprised because you are working in Germany and uh, even in France, we know that the uh, Peter Leisig uh, uh, clip uh, might be much more useful because they are much more, the, the, the forceps are very narrow and you can go in uh, deep fields and probably the, the angle of opening of the clips is better than the esculap. So wh wh why did you stay with, the, with this uh, esculap clips, uh, Henry? Because they, they are more stable if you have the, in the applier, if you have the LASIK one, you know, if you go in and there is some force, the clip will move in the forceps. And with the esculap, I what I use sometimes are the Zugita clips. We have an old version of Sugita clips. We have old clips in our secret box. And sometimes you ask the nurses, please bring it. And they open really wide. Yeah. And I have it's another trick. Use. We do the same, exactly the same. <laughs> I have another trick. There is a limitation of the clip applier, how far you can open the clip. And sometimes we bend this away so we can overstretch it and then we place the clip. Of course, a company cannot allow this to do because then their yeah, yeah, yeah. safety measures are not good. But then if you have the first clip, you can place a second one easily behind it, you know? And, and then you can get you can use clip. You can use the applier for the removing. So the remover, if you use the remover, you can open a little bit more. <laughs> but the remover has also this limitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably take too much space, yeah. <laughs> But what Pierre said, Pierre, the cases you, you've uh, shown, they are different. They are more lateral. They are more sphenoid wing meningiomas. And in these cases, I would do exactly like you. And I would not use the frontal lateral. I would use the pterional approach. So the combination lateral, medial, 
but they are different cases. The, the, the cases you have shown, they are a little bit different. But my message is to say that the ACP resection allows more skeletonization of, uh, of, the, uh, of the optic canal more than the coming from the, from, the, from the top, of course, which is much more limited. But I do agree that there are indications for that, uh, particularly for tuberculum cellae or yeah. jugum meningiomas. And you can go from the top and it's enough. Yeah. But you, once you need to reject the, the, the ACP in order to open the corridor between the carotid and the optic nerve and between the carotid and the third nerve, uh, ACP resection using a, a frontotemporal approach is, is mandatory. So they, you're, I agree, there are different cases. Different cases, yeah. yeah. So I use uh, the case, the approach you are describing, I like very much for meningiomas which are invading the bone. So. Um, these uh, interosseous meningiomas, they, they are. You know, orbitum. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Orbitum, orbitum meningiomas, yeah. Yes. Oh, thank you. Happy that you agree together now. <laughs> At the end of the yeah, webinar. Yeah, yeah. So. I have a question for, for Timote. Timote gave a talk about the ligaments at the beginning of his presentation. I would like to ask uh, Timote if the ligaments directly connect the bone by themselves or if these ligaments are, are parts of dural folds. Yes, thank you, Perig. I remember such question like that. Uh, mm -hmm. and <laughs> the ligament question is quite... Uh, a very good question. And the question is, can we separate them? Can we distinguish them uh, from the drua? Um, uh, could, you, could you precise which ligament do you think? No, you, you, you were talking about, uh, I, I, my feeling is that the Gruber's ligament is an independent ligament and which is uh, uh, between two bones. But uh, when you are talking about the ligaments which is connecting uh, the, the anterior and the posterior clinoid process uh, and the ligaments that delineate the oculomotor triangle, my, my perception of the things is that they are only uh, uh, rigid organizations of the dura, but uh, they are not connecting directly the bones. They are folds into the dura, right? Yeah, I completely understand. And that the... the you point to be absolutely right because if you think about that, the, the name of the ligament are sometimes just folds. And this is uh, when I talk about the anterior petroclinoid fold, it's just a fold, right? But sometimes if you go and do nasally, you can see some very different ligaments. And uh, the one I think is the interclinoidal ligaments. And sometimes you have some real ligaments between the two clinoid processes. And uh, this one is a real one. And some of them are just called your absolutely right period. OK, thank you. OK, I would like to, to thank you, to thank all of you for uh, your impressive talks. And it was truly a pleasure to organize this webinar with you this afternoon, I would say this evening now. <laughs> it was very interesting as usual. and. Uh, I will uh, invite you to come for the next uh, school-based section webinar, who is, which is scheduled uh, on April 21 on uh, Clive Cordomas. So you will all receive the invitation uh, in around one month for again a uh, yes school-based section webinar. Again, thank you to all of you. It's time to say you uh, have a good evening. Thank you so much. It was great to be with you. See you. Bye bye, Michael. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. See you next time.